Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed lunch. Who knew Italy had such good food? Yeah, it's fantastic. But it's uh, great to see so many of you still here, hanging on, uh, not out taking too many tourist photos of Florence, although I'm sure you'll be doing that this evening a little bit more. But to this afternoon, uh, we have a really great uh, couple of sessions coming up, and then the final set of uh, uh, presentations later this afternoon. So for the moment, um, we have uh, Meevan from Full Facts, who is going to give uh, a bit of insight into some of the, the actual facts behind yeah, fact checking and what's right and what's wrong and kind of the, the, the right way to do it. And as you've probably seen, there's quite a few other initiatives. Uh, joined again by Tiago from the World Bank, who uh, is going to give his perspective, maybe a bit more on the, uh, certainly what Meevan says, and on the kind of the rise of, you know, what are the conditions uh, that, that allow this uh, fake news to really thrive. And we have David Sasaki from Wellman Flora Hula Foundation, um, who has promised to extend the conversation further. Uh, that's all I've got from him so far. So uh, I think he's going to be reacting to what's said. But I'm going to ask him even to just give a bit of context up front, so maybe some of the headlines about fake news and al the alternative facts about alternative facts would be quite a good start. <laughs> Um, then ask Tiago and David to respond, and then we want to get to questions really as quickly as possible. So this should be as interactive a session as possible, which means I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Meevan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, there's a lot to rattle through, so let's get started. Uh, Full Fact is the UK's independent fact-checking charity. It's our job uh, with our partners to anchor public debate and reality. It was founded in 2010. We fact-checked the Leveson Inquiry, three referendums, two general elections, and we're working on our third. Thank you, Theresa May. Um, in the short term, we give people reliable information to make up their own minds on big issues. Unlike other fact-checking organizations, uh, we seek to get inaccurate claims corrected at source as well. We consider this second-generation fact-checking, um, the first generation being more the American type of fact-checking, which is more journalistic. In the medium term, we use the body of evidence from our fact-checking to diagnose systemic problems and improve the information eco ecosystem. For example, getting government departments to set up internal fact-checking services to prevent misinformation going out in the first place, and newspapers to set up corrections columns where the reason why the Daily Mail and the Sun have one. It can be done. In the long run, we're in a fight about the culture of public life. So our fact-checking is very much a campaign. It's not just we're going to give you the facts and leave it at that. It's about what interventions can we then make in the ecosystem to make sure that those checks and balances are in place. So what we believe about the world affects decisions we make. Um, whether we're citizens or presidents, bad information leads to bad decisions. Um, in 2016, before 2016, I would have had to justify that with another three paragraphs. But now all I have to say is post-truth and fake news and everyone gets it. Um, so, <laughs> fake news isn't just one problem. It's lots and lots of different problems. Um, and it's actually more a comment on the accountability and information ecosystem than it is one big scary thing that we have to solve. Um, I just tweeted out a blog post called Fake News, It's Complicated uh, by Claire Wardle, who runs First Draft News. It's absolutely fantastic, and I really recommend that you read it. It's on the Tic Tac hashtag. Um, in that, Claire Wardle basically distinguishes that there are different types of fake news, there are different motivations for fake news, and there are different distribution mechanisms. And these things interplay with each other to create different problems. Um, so from the types, everything from satire to fabricated content, motivations, everything from poor journalism to state-led propaganda, and distribution from your auntie who doesn't know how to use the internet to bot armies. Um, so, before I get into how we're solving those problems as full fact, there is a really important distinction that is kind of coming out more and more in this world. And that is the distinction between fact-checking and verification. Fact-checking is more about political claims that are made to change people's minds. Verifying content is kind of, that's kind of two sides of the same coin. Verification is more, did this thing actually occur? Uh, is this photo from when it was from? Um, and I think that's becoming more and more of a different kind of avenue because they require different skill sets and different tech to answer. Fact checking is more about different interpretations of political uh, sources and verification is more about can we 
I don't know, use the exif data? Can, can we actually go and see if this happened at that time? Is there any way of corroborating it? Um, so before I get into full fact, uh, we all need to, to have access to good information to help us place trust wisely. Because without it, we have some pretty shitty alternatives. Um, <laughs> we have the choice between blind cynicism, distrust everything as citizens, blind faith, trust everything you hear based on different sensitivities, or complete apathy. And all of these options are dangerous, and there are those willing to fill that civic vacuum that a pervasive distrust like that will leave. Fact-checking for us is about bridging that gap and helping give people the tools to place trust wisely. Um, so that when, let's say, Theresa May is saying poverty is down and Jeremy Corbyn says, no, it's up, which they do every week at Prime Minister's Questions, and they talk past each other, it's full facts job to say there are two measures of poverty in the country. One is going up. One is going down. Here's how they're different. Um, so it's about giving that kind of, adding back the shades of gray where there is black and white. Okay. <laughs> so what are we doing to solve all these, some of those problems? Um, we asked ourselves, how can we use technology to scale and quantify the work already being done by fact checkers around the world? The answer isn't to replace human fact checkers or journalists, but to support them. We're building tools that, uh, that allow that basically allow us to amplify the impact of the work already being done. Um, what we're building is the first end-to-end -end automated fact-checking engine, basically, available to a group of fact-checkers around the world. Um, it has two initial functions. Um, I know that's quite a big claim, isn't it? End-to-end fact-checking engine. Um, <laughs> but it's very simple. The tech already exists. Um, the engine will spot things that we've already fact-checked in new places and allows us to see the spread of misinformation, and more importantly, who is spreading it. And it will allow us, the second function is to allow us to detect and check new claims using NLP and structured data. Um, and where possible, it will, it will do the preliminary research to aid fact-checking of certain kinds of claims. This is not a panacea for all of the problems of fact-checking. It is basically about cutting down the time to do research and cutting down the time to get a fact-check to people, more than it is anything else. Um, so the two polished products that will come out of this engine, one's called Trends, and it will monitor people who monitor mi monitor, it's a monitoring tool <laughs> that will allow fact checkers to see who's repeating inaccurate information and allows them to target their work and corrections for maximum impact. Um, because we also do corrections, it's really important for us to quantify our own effect in the world. Did this intervention actually lead to a noticeable decrease in the number of times this was said. Um, and the second tool is called Live. It's for live fact-checking, which we help pioneer. And it's about, in real time, taking a stream of subtitles or captions and matching against a database of fact-checks from around the world. We've been fact-checking since 2010, so we're sitting on quite a lot of claims. And the nature of public debate is that politicians and campaigners repeat themselves because that is how you put information out into the world. So even a team of five fact-checkers once you get them working at internet scale with these tools, could actually make a really big dent in giving people the information they need. I also have more stuff on what the internet companies are doing, but I imagine that's going to come out later in the questions. Awesome stuff, thank you. Chago, any thoughts from you? I guess that you have lots of different problems. It's not just a simple thing. And kind of what, what leads to this stuff being so pernicious and pervasive? Yeah, so, I mean, that's not a subject that I'm the expert, so I'm just going to make things, say some things that I might not even believe, but just to make uh, some provocation. So first of all, I'll say uh, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the idea, not with fact-checking on what you guys do, but about there's a certain air of paternalism on this story of, of, of fake news, as if we wanted to help people to to solve these issues. So just to say, first of all, I'm a bit, there, there's something about it that is not clearly safe. So when you have like nudge, that it, they call very clearly liberal paternalism, they try to deal with this ethical problem of paternalism very head on, but doesn't seem to appear on, on the fake news uh, discussions. Um, but something that was said, no? but it's, it's, not, it's not a new thing. Uh, here in Firenze, you had the Pasquinale, 
which were these kind of like gossips going around that were published, uh, the Medici on how they got popes to be elected and stuff, lots of fake news, it was brilliant. Uh, and by the way, I'm an avid consumer of uh, fake news across the political spectrum, so you can say that with some property. Um, so if it's not new, what is the problem? I think what is, what is new? So maybe it's just because we're in the losing side. Um, had it had some outcomes been different, would we be discussing this now? Right. So, uh, so, so again, there appears to be some moral superiority here. That when it didn't work for us, then we start to go with the system. Now, there's another thing that I think about um, fake news is we seem to be treating it as a supply-driven type of problem. So what, I'm, what am I talking about? Um, I've been working recently with poaching, anti-poaching efforts, rhinos and elephants, kind of stuff that I never thought I'd be doing, but anyway. And uh, if you try to, if you, when you look at the problem, every time that you try to attack, try to control the supply of it, what you do is that the price goes up and mob comes in. And it's actually happening with the, with the news. Right? And so how much do you want to regulate or criminalize? For, I, because my first instinct is to regulate. But how much do you want to do that? Right? To make price will go up and mob will come in. And um, supply driven, treating problems as supply driven is like alcohol prohibition, war on drugs, and I will do the war on fake news. Not really sure. Particularly because it's a very human thing. I mean, I lived in Florence five years, very small town. You realize very soon that fake news is something that you can't get around. Um, so, and add to that another human bias, that is the confirmation bias, and you have a huge demand for fake news. So, how, and we're treating it as a problem. And what I find even more interesting is our expectation that private companies like social media companies and so on, they will handle human misery <laughs> to some extent, that it is our demand for fake news, and expecting that, mar that private firms will go and solve that problem. I mean, if they can help, it's great, but it is, a, it is our problem. It is not their problem. Um, the other thing is, which will bring me like to now a bit of a rant, you know? Democracy goes wrong and we talk about algorithmic accountability. Really? I mean, fix democracy. Don't go after the algorithm. Um, so, um, and if fake news for me, the only way to deal with it is discernment, plus some good fact checking. But discernment you fix with education. So what is the role of education into fake news and how we will create discernment on an environment that is increasingly uh, fake news rich? Um, so that's my question. How do we deal with it? But I would, my first thing I'd say, like, let's try to take a bit the burden out of, of private firms who are private. They're not the public sphere. So that's my thoughts on that. Okay, so, so David, I mean, whose problem is it anyway? And uh, it, it, are we just so losers in this respect? Whose problem is fact checking? Or, yeah, dealing dealing with the, the yeah. fake news. And is it just dealing with the symptoms rather than the cause? Um. So I, I think there is. Pro I don't. I don't. No, I haven't seen evidence. I think there's probably an increase in fake news over time and that there are a few drivers of that that I'll try to take a stab at of what that is. But I also think that there's an increase in truthiness. So it's also in increasingly difficult to say this is a mm. false claim and this is a true claim because there's more complexity in the world and there are, there's more contradictory evidence that each person can cite that is increasingly segregated across different communities of users. I think part of this also gets at the problem of external validity or being able to replicate findings in academic research. So if you have, you know, if you have, 
if you have, uh, let's say, 100 studies that say one thing, but then you have 10 studies that say another thing, there used to be journals and uh, paternalistic bodies of information that would be able to sort of say, well, it seems that this is true, because 100 things say this, only 10 things mm. say that. But now we're losing those gatekeepers that are able to have, that are the sort of, uh, that's the authority to say, here's what those 110 studies say, and rather you can have a community that says, look at what these 10 studies say, this is the truth, and you can have a separate community that says, look at what these 100 studies say, this is the truth, and, and there's no uh, arbiter of how you interpret those things. Um, so I think this is a real question, and Tiago got it, and even got it too, how info-paternalistic do we want to be? How interventionist do we want to be, those of us who design information delivery systems, or those of us who think about public policy that regulates these things, um, what, how do we want to address the diminishing stance of gatekeepers? And this for me is, is really bizarre because the first 10 years of my career was celebrating the fall of gatekeepers. They were so snobby and they thought that, they, like The Economist I thought was the worst. New York Times was just terrible because you know, they would publish the things that they thought were interesting and then there was all of this other stuff that was coming up on the internet that to me was incredibly interesting and was underrepresented mostly because of issues around marginalization. I didn't think about issues around truth at that time. And I'll, I'll end with just a couple, uh, a couple of things that I've seen lately that I've liked. One of them is a collection of blog posts on kotkey.org, which is an old blog from way back in the day. And it was a collection of blog posts about, it's kind of internet nostalgia. It felt a little bit like listening to hip hop from the 1990s. So it was like describing what the internet was like in, from 2000 to 2010. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna exaggerate a lot here. and I'm gonna offer a very simplistic binary of what, to me, the internet from 2000 to 2010 felt like. And that was that it was a curiosity and reflection machine. So I would wake up, I would search for information on Google. You had this incredible thing that provided you all this really interesting information. Then I would get lost in Wikipedia for an hour. I would just click from link to link to link. Sometimes I would even look at the discussion pages to see how people were debating what ultimately got onto the Wikipedia page. And then I would sit in a coffee shop and I would write a blog post reflecting on what I had learned. That would take me like two hours and I would have to really think about things. My experience of the internet from 2010 to 2017 is that I wake up, I open a stream of updates and links from my friends and their friends. I then share those things that inspire me and that make me very angry. And sometimes I add some emoji, hopefully to offer a little bit of wit. I try to get as many retweets and likes as possible. And then at the end of the day, I share a photo of my food or face or pet. And that's like very exaggerated depictions of how the internet has changed. But I think that there's something there that as we went from a search paradigm for information to a sharing paradigm for information, it opened up this space where I mean, I guess it's the filter bubble, but it, it's not having shared bodies of knowledge that we're able to tap into and have a common conversation around. And I just don't get how you address the vicious cycle of polarization around attitudes and around what is acceptable fact without having a very top-down, interventionist, info-paternalistic way of doing so. So in not 30 seconds, the last thing that I'll say, one of my favorite books is Technopoly by Neil Postman, and he goes through a history of when there was a proliferation of information, people were very overwhelmed by all of this information, and then they developed social control to try to clamp down on all of these crazy people publishing all of this wild stuff. So one of the ones that he talks about is you've got the printing press, people start publishing pamphlets, they're putting up pamphlets on plazas, on doors, um, you know, Lutheran, all of this stuff. Uh, and so his argument is that the invention of the school system and school curricula is a way to say, here's what's an acceptable body of literature and everything else is not. Everything else is crazy talk. Now we're asking, what do we want Facebook and Google and Twitter, but especially Facebook, to do to say, here's the acceptable thing. And Tiago's talking about the nudge, right? The little thing that says, come up, says like, we think this is crazy talk, but if you wanna go ahead, go ahead. Um, are we gonna get to the point where there's gonna be a call for regulation to say, we need to be more interventionist than that? So, Mevan, I think you had 
just a brief overview of some of the initiatives that are going on at the moment, and then maybe from there we could just go into some questions, which I'm assuming there's going to be a few. Yeah. Um, I, I get the point on regulation, by the way, but I do think, and I think we should be very mm. careful about the regulation point, and the free speech siren will go off any minute now. Um, but it's, I think, fact-checking is the free speech answer mm. to misinformation, basically. So it's important to weigh that up as well. Mm. And, show that it is the other part of the seesaw, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, so what are the companies doing? <laughs> um, this is not a comprehensive overview, it's just what I could remember. Um, so the, there's a claim review schema um, which was launched, um, and that is about structuring data in fact-checking websites. Um, it was first, uh, I think it was launched in October 2016, um, and it was consumed into Google News. So Fact checks were first featured in Google News for the first time, um, like opinion pieces or everything else. And just a few weeks ago, it's now being featured in Google Search. Um, so you see the claim, you see the conclusion, and you see um, the person who said it. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, Google Digital News Initiative also funded three fact checking projects. Uh, the prototype funds for 50,000 euros. There's the Facebook third party fact checker thing, um, which is about giving fact checkers sort of access to the stream and being able to say, not just fact checkers actually, it needs to make that very clear. They started off saying fact checkers and now it's extended to people who wouldn't actually fall within that range, which is slightly controversial. Um, but it stops people spreading misinformation once it's been flagged as inaccurate. Um, they recently launched a news literacy campaign as well, which were top 10 tips um, to help you spot fake news, which they did in a lot of countries. Um, First Draft News runs something called Crosscheck in France, which is a partnership between the French newsrooms for the French election to try and centralize their fact-checking efforts, centralize verification, um, and have a wider spread. And I can't even begin to explain the number of conferences and hackathons that have happened this past year. It's been quite hard. <laughs> so, a few hands for some questions. Where should we start? I find it hard to believe no one has a question on this topic in this audience. We got one there? Behind the pillar, so I can't see. Again, just see who you are and where Hi. you're from as well. All right. Um, I'm kind of wondering what you all think. Uh, I really like this idea of the the paradigm shift in the internet from 2010 to 2017 as um, one from search to share. And I wonder, is there an opportunity, or am I just kind of being naive and, about this, but is there an opportunity for having a more self-governing, self-policing kind of uh, um, approach to the internet where we're, we're more discerning, we're more literate, and we're able to better kind of call out certain things? So do we need the mandarins? Do we need to have those people installed again to, to kind of police this? Not to say that you know, there isn't a, a role for professionals in all of this, but is there an opportunity to disseminate those skills more and making people more literate um, to be able to, just, so there's no longer an incentive, right, to, to, uh, to troll or to um, have this kind of content be put out there, no, no longer a, a reason for it. I, I think there's a lot of interesting research that's been done. So I, I don't think that uh, Facebook should install people to look at every status update that's published and say, like, this is acceptable, that's not acceptable. I, I do think that fact-checking is really promising. Some of the early research shows, from what I understand, that it's difficult to change individual readers' minds. There just aren't that many of us who go to fact-checking websites. There aren't that many of us who read news So and then fact-check our news. But there are examples of when fact-checking changes what politicians and pundits feel like they're able to say because they know that somebody is watching them and that there will be some sort of, um, it'll affect their reputation in some sort of way. So I think that's really important. And then media literacy I think is just huge. I think we have to take on, I think the education system is an opportunity at scale to reach tons of people and there's probably a lot of research that can be done into how do you more effectively raise a generation yeah. of media literate internet 
users that uses neuroscience. I mean, I, in the New Yorker, they've been publishing a lot on why facts don't change people's minds and why emotional storytelling and heart tugging does seem to work. Mm -hmm. But I've seen less research on how do you create literate, discerning mm -hmm. readers of news. I think um, you're absolutely right. We call it the they know we check effect. Um, and fact checking is inherently confrontational and it's about accountability. I think if we were thinking about building an organization that was about trying to change people's minds and to make them have a more holistic view of an issue, it might not be a fact checking organization, guys. <laughs> Shakara. Um, it, it probably would start from what, what are the big misconceptions that people have? Um, what are the stories we could tell them to change their mind? But every story has, especially if it's about an issue, has a, a core of truth in it. We're not saying every paragraph has to be a fact, but at least the core shouldn't be totally <coughs> divergent from that, that truth. Um, and I think it's important that there is an ideal that we strive to. Now, on the education front, Chequiado and Argentina do some absolutely incredible work. Um, and they actually take fact-checking out of it entirely and just start thinking about how could you verify what your friend said about this party that you're going to. Um, and it's like a story that you do throughout Facebook and you're verifying pictures and where it happened and how it happened and the story that you told your friends and whether it was true or not. Anyway, it's fantastic and I'd highly recommend you, you check it out if you're thinking about education. Yeah, but just, just on the education, I think education is, is the way, particularly the issue of scale that I find very interesting. But again, it's a dem it, it, there's a good chance it's a demand-driven problem. So as long as there will be human beings, there will be demand for fake news. I like reading fake news. So people like it. And particularly if that confirms my vision of my world, it's great. Come on, I don't like to, to see research to say that citizen engagement doesn't work. I have to see it, you know, because it's part of my job. But if I wanted to be cozy and comfortable, I'd be just looking what I like. So just to say, we, it, it will be around us as long as we're here. Um, I'd also say uh, Tim Hufford uh, makes the argument that scientific curiosity is the answer to a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. Because creating a space where people are curious about an issue is a very different space to a fact-checking space where you're like, you're wrong, this is right. Um, and it's interesting to think about that in an education mm -hmm. context as well. Excellent. Any more questions? One down here and then one from someone up the back. So, Tiago, I think where you're using the word paternalistic, <coughs> where you're using the word paternalistic, I might use the word coordinated. Um, I think there's been a big shift in the online information environment. Maybe five years ago, I would have agreed with a lot of what you're saying, but right now, there's active propaganda campaigns geo-targeted by paid staffers of Russia ahead of elections, timed intentionally in, US, in Western democracies, including the US. I don't think it's a sore loser problem to be concerned about that, and I don't think that um, it's just a question of fake news being fun and affirming my world belief when it's being used to manipulate me and people like me. Um, I don't know if there's a question mark on that, but mm. that's how I feel about it. I, know, I, I, I see it, and yes, yeah, maybe there should be some transparency on how things are targeted. No, this is something that Tom raised uh, the other day, so that, that, that would be very interesting indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, algorithm transparency, right? You can't hold an algorithm accountable. But, but so on the, the ads point, um, the targeting of ads, uh, the Vote Leave campaign said that they, Tom, Tom's here and has spoken about this already, right? I wasn't here yesterday. Um, the Vote Leave campaign said in a blog post that they had sent out a billion ads on Facebook a couple of days before the vote for the EU referendum. And there's absolutely no accountability of what that is, even though we ask the Electoral Commission in the, in the UK asks what are the things you'll be putting out, what are the posters you'll be putting out in the leaflets. But for digital ads, there isn't that kind of accountability. And that makes scrutiny of those ads very, very difficult. Um, so maybe it's not about getting the 
Googles and Facebooks of the world to publish it, but maybe that is something where regulation could come in handy, having a central mm -hmm. repository of the, of the ads that are being put out and who they're targeted at. So we can try and at least balance out that effect if possible. Cool. So we've got a question at the back here and then down the front and at the back. Uh, Paul from Society. I've got two linked questions. Um, the first is, it seems to me as though what we're seeing today is actually just a new iteration of an old phenomenon, which is um, vested interests having influence over elections. So in 1992, The Sun, the most widely newspaper in the, read newspaper in the UK, famously had a front page saying, if Labour win tomorrow, we're the last person to leave the country, please turn out the light. And infamously they said, it's The Sun what won it. So are we just seeing a trend from different vested interests or the same best interests using other forms. And the second is, do we risk focusing on fake news to the expense of kind of broader social and cultural issues? Arguably one of the most shocking things in the US presidential election were Donald Trump's pussy grabber comments. Those were not fake news, and many of his voters believed he said them and meant them, and yet they still voted for him anyway. Are they not larger societal issues that we need to be considering here too? Absolutely, and I really hope everyone's working on them. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to with social cultural issues, but I, I do think that when we talk about fake news, be, especially because of the last year, we overemphasize the role of fake news in electoral outcomes, but it affects all sorts of things. I follow Africa Check, which is a, a pan-African fact-checking organization, mostly Nigeria, um, South Africa and Kenya, and a lot of the fact checking that they do is around rumors of like how you treat uh, HIV and AIDS, yeah. uh, a lot of health oriented one. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, which prizes itself like the March for Science or whatever it was called in the Bay Area was huge, and you know everyone loves evidence informed policy making, but vaccination rates are very low in the San Francisco Bay Area and in, in the north in Marin. Um, and then there's this GMO, this anti-GMO thing, which is huge too, which doesn't seem to really be based on science either. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not just like mm. supporters of populism who are subject to mm. fake news. I think it affects all of us. No, I just think it, you can't think of that and think, for instance, the debate about contraception in Africa and HIV and all that. I mean, if you want to go against fake news, do you want to go, who, who are we going to start going after? And are we really willing to go after some of it? The, 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 the story of fake news and the ones that creates, for instance, health disasters, uh, they are, it's, it's, it's a big fight. I, I have, a, I think I have a solution, but the problem. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is that I, I, my hunch is that there is no hope of implementing it unless there's some kind of third world war, and so I'm, I'm really Could glad. Could be right that, around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that everybody is, you know, concentrating on education. And I, after 30 years of uh, political activism, I've come to the conclusion in the last few years that. The, the real key is civic education mm. for you know, all, of the, all of the problems in democracy. Mm. And um, there's a wonderful model for this, which is Gründer Centrale für Politische Bildung in Germany. And I think it's a one of a, it's a, one of a kind um, agency. It's called the Federal Agency for Civic Education. Mm. And it was, um, I think it was designed by Americans after the Second World War. And the wonderful thing about it is that it's an agency that um, decides on what is going to be taught in the school regarding uh, democracy mm -hmm. and it's completely independent and it's very well funded <laughs> and mm -hmm. I believe I really think that I'd like for some people to do research on this I think in the last 50-60 years the fact that Germany is, is it's incredibly it has a very strong civil society compared to other European countries without having even though it has an absolutist background, which most European countries that have had that, they, they have weaker civil societies, and this is an exception. And I think it's a really great model. It's just that, of course, every single government, <laughs> it, I think, or almost all of them, um, are 
going to resist this kind of effort, but I would love to see this um, somewhere else. And so it's just a comment, but if you have any feedback I'd, or ideas, I'd be interested. I mean, there's some governments that I work with that I really don't want them to start telling what should be taught in school or not. You know, but my, my fear is I, I like the idea a lot. Actually, David had mentioned this the other day. Uh, I like the idea a lot. But again, it seems like one of those things that really need a well-functioning government, otherwise it can get instrumentalized very quickly. Yeah, but what my fear is how independent it really gets in practice. No, I'm saying in other places. I'm saying just, well, but any good policy can become turned into evil, of course. But I, I do like the idea. But. So I work at the Civic Media Group at the MIT Media Lab, and we recently did a study on um, the elections, and we were looking at which were the most influential sources in the election, and we found that the ones that were listed fake news websites, and I mean, you know, the ones that are listed as the Macedonian teen run ones, were not very influential at all. There was more written on fake news than fake news itself, and what that's done is it's, and Ethan Zuckerman's written a great piece on this, it's created this red herring for you know, someone like Trump, where everything he disagrees with, it's very easy to then say, hey, that's fake news. And that's a dangerous um, justification to give somebody. So I guess my question is that if we are going to focus on fake news just as these fake news websites, the new problem there, and not the entire social aspect like Tiago said, which is, you know, a societal thing to correct, how does fact-checking address that problem mm. because mm -hmm. fact checking relies on this naming and shaming of the reputation of the source. Now these pages don't care about the reputation. So I guess I'm trying to wonder about. Yeah. Mm. Um, we actually do no naming and shaming. Um, so the f that's a decision that we've made. We don't go after the people who made the claim, we go after the claim. Um, and it is absolutely fair that sometimes things are quoted wrong. People forget things, people paraphrase in bad ways. Um, and so full fact, we'll never say that this person lied because um, it implies a lot of intention, which we, there's absolutely no way that we can prove. Um, so for us, it's, it's about that kind of type of political claim, actually, where you have to, where there are lots of different types of interpretations, and there are lots of different sources that could, that could justify or, or discredit it, and it's about showing people the complexity that exists and allowing them to make up their own mind about it and going back to the source, the best available evidence that exists. That's what we're best at. When it comes to these fake news websites, I would hark back to the verification point, like mm. that these aren't news websites, and this is a verification problem mm. instead. Um, some of them are just, you know, like the, the Macedonian teenagers, with some of those stories, like, I don't know, mm. the Pope and Dawson Trump, or Hillary Clinton is a lizard. Like, some of them are just outright verification problems, it's not possible. Um, and, and so I, I don't really have an answer for those, those kinds of websites because yeah, they can pop up overnight, they get a lot of ad money overnight and they can be spread overnight. Can you, yeah, I think it's a final comments. Okay, so this will be my, because I think it's such an important point and this ties into the last word on the panel about populism. Fake news feels like it's something that we can do something about. Whereas I think what a lot of us are concerned about, increasing populism-led autocracy, feels like it has very little to do with truth and fact. I think that a lot, in the US, I think that a lot of Trump supporters know that he's not telling the truth and don't really care. They're like, I don't, it doesn't matter if he's telling the truth, I think he's gonna take the country in the direction that I'd like to see it go. And for me, this is rooted in the fact that around, so to go, to, for me everything changed in 2010, I don't know why, this is my arbitrary year, where you had the, the liberal democracy consensus and then there was a reframing of how we think about the world from liberal democracy to open versus closed. And for us, openness was transparency, it was participation, and it was adoption of technology and innovation. Those were the explicit things that we were all talking about. But implicitly, we also support, I think almost everyone in this room, uh, migration, multiculturalism, inclusion, and probably free trade, because we all benefit from those things. And I think that we overestimated 
the appeal of the first things, the transparency, the participation, and all that, and we under under underestimated in many developed democracies the importance to a lot of voters of those other things. And that's what's really driving the populism. And fake news is something that I think we increasingly need to be worried about. I think a lot about dystopian futures of what fake news is gonna look like, or its equivalent 10 years from now, which I think mm. could be like AI-driven fake news with bots that you can't even tell apart. I think it's wild. But for where we are today, it feels like we're actually hearing from this kind of silent, not quite majority. And, and that's something that we're not gonna be able to address with fact checking. I think I said everything I had to say. <laughs> Any famous thoughts? Please read that blog post from Claire Waddle because fake news is an awful term. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much, guys.